Okay, we're live. We are good to go. Let me just do one quick check, everybody. Alexander and Mr. Robert Barnes, the great Robert Barnes. Let me just do a check on Odyssey, on uh, Rumble. We got YouTube and we got Locals as well, the great Locals chat. So we are live. We are joined here with uh, Alexander Beckers in London. And we have the one and only, the great Mr. Robert Barnes. Mr. Barnes, where can people find you real quick? Uh, the best is uh, always at vivabarneslaw.locals.com. That's where you can find all the content, create their own content. It's the only place where I read everything uh, every day. Uh, so that's the best place uh, by far. All right. Definitely plug into uh, Robert and Viva's channel on uh, on Locals. It is absolutely fantastic. Robert does these uh, these shows. I think it's a weekly show, isn't it, Robert? The Hush Hush. Yeah, is it, it every it, week. Uh, basically, whatever it strikes. Sometimes there'll be one a week. Sometimes there'll be four mm. in a week. It all varies, but they're basically alternative histories and alternative narratives to events. And they've been a little too predictive of late. On, you know, on, <laughs> sometimes unfortunately. <laughs> But uh, and sometimes, fortunately, I mean, like the discussion of the Ukraine war going in a certain direction yeah. helped uh, persuade some uh, elected officials and would be elected officials uh, to uh, to take a certain path they might not have otherwise taken. Yeah. Uh, so there's there's been there's utility to it. But, yeah, if you want an alternative history yeah. for past events, predictions of future events, it's just an alternative take. It's based on uh, James Elroy's great American tabloid trilogy. And going back to L.A. Confidential, uh, which is like an alternative narrative or interpretation of American history between 1963 and 1972 uh, or thereabouts. And uh, and there's a lot of utility to seeing it as a template to how American power operates. It's kind of like Jean Le Carre, uh, you know, his Russia house, a man most wanted. You know, if you want to understand renditions, you, you got more accuracy out of that than you did out of official government reports in the United States at the time. Things like that. Hmm. definitely well worth it definitely absolutely the, uh, the hush hush is, is is a fantastic uh it's a fantastic program. absolutely yeah. absolutely i completely so, agree uh, I, I i absolutely agree all uh, right one, so of let's its, get... one of its kind as well by the way okay so yes absolutely so let's get started i'm going to pass it off to you in one second alexander so you and robert can get into all of the the news and topics that we need to discuss and boy do we have a lot to discuss let me just say a quick hello to our moderators on uh the you the youtube chat i am seeing alan watson is with us who else is with us alan who's helping you out um in the the chat or is it just alan tonight i'm sure more people will join i'm just seeing alan right now all right so thank you alan for moderating and for any moderators that are going to jump in later on the show, thank you very much. Mm. All right, Alexander, Robert, um, we have a lot of stuff mm. to, to mm. cover. I'm just going to say my my two cents. Um, mm. 33 billion, actually 40 billion now is mm. uh, is going to Ukraine. Biden has already burned through, I believe, 13.8 billion already. They're on the last hundred million. He just signed the lend lease, so we got more stuff heading to mm. Ukraine as well. The EU is going to be taking out loans, 15 billion loans, 15 billion dollar loans every three months in order to uh, to fund Ukraine. Mm -hmm. And we have 300 billion that was already stolen from uh, foreign reserves way mm -hmm. at the beginning of this. This is like peak insanity at this point mm -hmm. in time. Anyway, that's all I have to say, because absolute madness what's going on. Alexander, Robert, the, the floor is yours. Well, I agree, Alex. But can I also say that I... I remember something that um, um, Robert asked us on a program, which is whether we could ever remember an administration more disastrous in modern American history than this one. And I have to say, I, I simply don't now. I mean, I, I think at the time uh, Robert asked that question, it was already looking incredibly grim. Uh, it seems to me everything is going, uh, not just apart, coming apart, but everything is going wrong in the most extraordinary, ludicrous way. And I, I, I have to say, there's an element of senility about this. I mean, Lend-Lease, this all reminds I mean, it's it's an old man, it seems to me. This is, it reminds me of an old man 
he remembers the stories of his childhood about, you know, lend lease during the war and how it, you know, transformed the situation of the Allies, you know, Britain and the Soviet Union, too, by the way. Um, and I think he's somehow he and the people around him think that they can relive all of that. So they're going to have lend lease for Ukraine and for the East European countries. But, you know, you've got to understand something about Lend-Lease. Lend-Lease works in two ways. Firstly, the country that's provided with the weapons has to pay eventually. But who pays in the meantime? The U.S. government does. It's the U.S. taxpayer. It's not free. It's not just, you know, money, uh, weapon systems appearing out of nowhere. So, in effect, what this Lend-Lease program is doing is it's committing the United States to a kind of unlimited arms build-up, as far as I can see, in Ukraine and Eastern Europe with Uncle Sam writing the checks. Now, I don't know whether I have understood this right, Robert, but that's how it comes across to me. And, of course, if you think that Ukraine is going to pay back these loans, well, I have a bridge to sell you. <laughs> that's all I can say about it. So it, it, it's, again, uh, the old man, he, he's out of touch. He doesn't know what he's doing. He's triggered this huge inflation crisis. He's making that inflation crisis worse. He's got all of these strange people around him uh, um, who want to involve the United States in ever more conflicts. We did a program, Alex and I, earlier today about these changes in, um, you know, the website, the State Department website over Taiwan. I mean, whatever you may think of that, I mean, is this the right time now to be riling up China and to be dragging us into some kind of conflict over Taiwan when, uh, you know, Ukraine is not settled? And of course, we also have policies in the United States itself that seem to me to be increasingly irrelevant to America's problems which this administration is not making worse. It is making exponentially worse. And you have simultaneously with all of this in Europe, European governments who seem to be in competition with each other as to who is going to do the most damage in the European economy. And uh, we were talking again about the oil import ban, which Ursula von der Leyen seems to be obsessed with imposing on Europe. There's been some pushback from some of the East European states and Hungary's holding up, but sooner or later, I think it's going to come. Except of course, uh, as Alex and I also discussed earlier today, we now he heard that the Greeks, the ship owning, the Greek ship owners have been able to claw out a, um, um, a provision that they could continue to ship Russian oil. Now, you know, I, I worked on the fringes, the far fringes of the Greek shipping world, and I have known in my time lots of ship owners, and I've talked about to them about what, you know, I know what they did, you know, with Iran sanctions and the Iraq sanctions. I tell you what's going to happen. They're going to be stocking, you know, piling up their oil tankers with Russian oil, shipping it from Vladivostok. The oil tanker will go around the world. There'll be all kinds of documents created. And, you know, you, you, you're probably better at knowing about how this is done than I am, uh, Robert, but I know it is done. <coughs> Creating a whole sort of <coughs> history for this oil. And, of course, eventually, where will it end up? It will end up in Europe. But we will be paying through the nose for it because all the middlemen who laundered it will have their cuts. Uh, no doubt. I mean, I think two things there in terms of the, the shipping aspect. I mean, some of that's already happening. As long as it's 49% <coughs> Russian oil, it's not considered Russian oil, apparently under the sanctions list. So you have people just you know dumping it into other barrels and boom. Of course, what somebody <laughs> smart will do is what you're mentioning. They'll just change the label. Uh, I had a case years ago where someone was supposed to be in the business of providing very quick uh, critical supplies that were from specific uh, makers of those supplies. And they were from Asia. And the, you know, the, the, the China uh, and Southeast Asia concept of intellectual property, let's just say isn't always exactly the same as it is in America. 
And they sat there and like, why would you go and get this specific part? I'll just go and get a generic version and stick the label on it. Uh, and, you know, there's a wide range of issues of that, Rico, fraud, et cetera. But that, that's what they were doing. They were just sticking the label on it, got a major competitive advantage. They figured, I'll just print the labels. Why get the parts? Uh, just get a generic substitute. And so that dynamic of is going to happen. I mean, basically, you're right. All it's going to do is jack up the price, and you're going to pay a smuggler's tax now. Uh, you know, and, and that that's it. Now, in terms of land, uh, and then that's why it's all for for not. And of course, as long as the oil price is going up in general, commodity price. I mean, Russia's net and still net profiting. Russia's economy grew in the first quarter uh, this year. The American economy shrank in the first quarter, which is not supposed to happen, of course. Definitely not supposed to happen with the sanctions. But the uh, second aspect is lend lease. I mean, it's classic of us. I mean, this was FDR's way to get around directly helping in World War One. Uh, or I'm sorry, World War Two. Uh, and even though he was also involved in World War One, but indirectly while he was at the Navy, sinking the Lusitania, another story there. Um, but the uh, was that, hey, we're not really getting involved in the war. We're actually just doing something that'll be profitable for us over time. I mean, what it took the Brits and the and the Russians what sixty years to pay back the the lend lease, uh, it, it, I mean, and and those countries were countries that were in a position to pay it back. As you know, Ukraine will not be, especially if Ukraine is a rump state at the end of this. If all of their richest agricultural land, uh, their strongest industrial land, their most resource rich land, the land that has access to the ports and the seas. Uh, is all gone, which appears to be uh, a likely outcome of this war if it continues at, at the pace it does currently. There's no way they're paying back that money. This was a, the poorest economy in Europe to begin with, one of the poorest economies in the world to begin with. Um, and now you take away their agricultural land. You take away, I mean, it's not just that, that you know, from Kharkov all the way down to Odessa, not only is that the historical 1922 areas that was added officially to the then existing Ukraine, hence Putin's reference to, I'm going to decommunize your borders for you, uh, since you, you, you don't like, uh, the, you, you blame the Soviets for everything. Well, I'll show you what that looks like. The, uh, but it's also, you look at it as a map of where, where are the wheat fields, where's the agricultural wealth, where's the rich farmland, where's the rich, where's the natural gas or oil deposits to the degree they exist there, where's other resources, where are their great factories, where are their big industry. It's all in that same reach. Overall, I mean, there's a little bit in the West, but not a lot. And and then, of course, that's the part that Poland has already has Polish TV on the other day showing, hey, look, look, let's see what this looks like. You know, bringing back the old Western section back in to the Polish uh, where it was, you know, associated with the Polish Lithuanian Empire. They thought of it as under Ruthenian lords and whatnot, going back to the Kevin Rus and the local population, but has been affiliated on the global maps as part of Poland or, or the Polish Lithuanian Empire going way, way, way back. So. I think that the given that the land lease has almost no chance of being paid back. So uh, it, it is just a way to pretend you're not directly just spending more money on a country than you already are. It will be interesting to watch the vote on the 40 billion. So there's two things that they do with all these bills in the States. So it is in the 40 billion. How much of it actually goes to Ukraine is an interesting question. Um, because they 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 stick in in order to get everybody's votes and on board, they stick in everybody's little pet project. So somehow somebody's bridge project in rural Pennsylvania is part of aid to Ukraine, you know that kind of thing. So there'll be a bunch of what they call pork here, loosely in the United States, uh, 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 padded in there in, in order to get as many votes. But they assume it would it would pass with ease because the the sanctions vote only eight members of the House opposed it. Uh, six Republicans, two Democrats. Nobody in the Senate opposed it. It was 100 to zero, like your Gulf of Tonkin type vote. And the uh, now the six Republicans that voted against it were the six Republicans that the one libertarian, Thomas Massey, and then the five that are the closest to the base, Paul Gosar, Marjorie Taylor Greene, Matt Gates, Madison Cawthorn, uh, uh, in particular, those four. All four, uh, three of those four were then targeted uh, to be removed from the ballot uh, on the grounds that they supported the insurrection and all this gibberish. All those efforts have failed, but they still face the consequence. Madison Cawthorn had the Republican Party hierarchy in his own state come after him. Both Senator Tom Tillis, a corrupt hack, and uh, and Senator Burr, who, by the way, is under investigation 
uh, because he and his brother were engaged in illegal trading using in inside information on the pandemic. He's under mm -hmm. criminal investigation in uh, New York currently. Um, that's who these guys are, but they're political hacks. Burr's Senate Intelligence Committee, which is basically run by the Intelligence Committee. It was created by Frank Church to govern the Intelligence Committee. It's been hijacked by the Intelligence Committee to govern the Senate. Uh, but so that gives you an idea that they came after him, but they haven't budged on their positions. And their positions have become that that populist position has become more and more popular uh, within the Republican base, especially the, the only two Democrats, the entire anti-war Democratic Congressional Caucus is made of two pro-Palestinian congressmen. That's it right now. Elon Omar and Rashid Tlaib. Uh, that's it. Uh, they're, they're the only ones to vote against saying, which is pitiful, really sad that, that where the Democratic Party anti-war base has gone. That doesn't mean it's not there in the popular vote, but it, it there's this gap between the rep elected representatives and the ordinary people, what they want, especially on issues like war. And there always has been in America, it's a weakness of representational government, that those individuals can be co-opted or they can represent a class interest that's different than the people they're representing, et cetera. But on war and, and deep state politics, it's been particularly bad. Now, when we last talked, we said that uh, I mentioned that the, one of the big real referendums on the popularity of the war would be the primary of J.D. Vance in Ohio. And uh, I talked to J.D. Vance when he was making his decision on all of this. Uh, talked to him for over an hour. And ultimately, Vance's thought was, you know what, I'm only running to make a difference. And the, the politician's crime is they get so obsessed that they have to win in order to make a difference that they start only caring about winning and quit figuring out why they ran in the first place. He's like, I don't want to make that mistake. So, But he was saying, look, he goes, I'm going to have deep state uh, people come after me, the entire apparatus, the donors are going to cut me off. There's going to be money spent against me as soon as I make my stand public. I'm going to have the uh, media institutions, Murdoch's engines come after me. I'm going to have all of this to deal with. Um, and, uh, but, you know, I think it, you know, you know had, and he was curious, how do I, how did the, uh, I think it was going to play out. And the predictions that uh, both of you have been making uh, have been accurate pretty much all the way through. And that ended up being valuable and it was a, because if you're someone like a J.D. Vance and I talked to other elected representatives, other people seeking office, if you're if your predict predictions are accurate over a 15, 30, 45 day period, that helps a lot with their confidence and saying, OK, I can take this path. And I know it may be a popular path with voters, but it's an unpopular path with powerful people and institutional actors. But if those institutional actors narratives keeps be, are, are wrong consistently then I can have more confidence in the uh, in what's taking place. J.D. Vance uh, went up. He, at the time, he was fourth or fifth in the polls, single digits, went on a debate stage. But his key opponents all said they would support a no-fly zone and whatever else it took to help Ukraine. He said, absolutely not. Won't support a no-fly zone. Won't support intervention. Won't support sanctions. Won't su we have no business. Ukraine can worry about Ukraine's borders. We need to worry about America's borders. Um, and he surged and surged until the point he was tied with first. Now, he got... The Wall Street Journal wrote a hit piece on him. Politico wrote a hit piece on him. Uh, the key donors said, we're not going to give you another penny, nickel, dime, or dollar. Big money came in from the corporate, you know, the, the Chamber of Commerce and other sort of, uh, you know, uh, what's called dark money here in America, money that you don't find out about until after the election as to who it came from. Tens of millions of dollars were spent against him. And he still surged. And Trump was watching. Donald Trump Jr. was watching. Trump put out his statement. That's the only statement he's made about Ukraine now in a while, which was we need peace now. So much so that Noam Chomsky came out and said the only person who has a reasonable position and Chomsky had an intense Trump, you know, TDS uh, said is Donald Trump is the only one who has a reasonable position of a position of stature in the West. And then uh, Donald Trump Jr. made a very big anti-war speech uh, on behalf with uh, J.D. Vance in Ohio. And what happens? J.D. Vance not only wins. He exceeds all the betting market uh, you know, edges in terms of the probability of victory, in terms of the margin of victory, almost won by double digits. In fact, for the first time ever, the Democratic vote in, I mean, the uh, east northeastern Ohio, which is sort of working class, industrial heartland of America, more people voted in the Republican primary than voted in the Democratic primary for the first time in a century in those two counties. And that was with a Democratic candidate for the Senate who's from that region on the ballot in Tim Ryan, who briefly ran for the presidency. And so uh, Vance is going to win in Ohio big. And so we've seen a test of what the ordinary, everyday Republican mm -hmm. populist wing thinks. Yeah. 
same in, in, uh, throughout large parts of the country. The, the gap is the institutional influence of the deep state and the media and the think tanks and the in the academies in the uh, in the donor class is is still very, very strong. Now, what helps J.D. Vance is increasingly in America, you can raise money without the donor class controlling it. The the technological revolution of being able to do mass crowdsourced funding has revolutionized. That's why Bernie Sanders went from a gadfly to a serious player solely because of the technological capabilities of a small do- a small donor in terms of amounts, but broad support transferring uh, power away from the donor class as a gatekeeper into who could run for, for significant office. As well, the rise of the independent media. The rise of the independent media has, has gen- you know, the, the kind of people supporting J.D. Vance in the social media space, and like when, when Politico was trying to understand how did this happen, because couldn't have been because of his anti-war position, because everybody knows that, that's, that's not popular. Wisdom of Politico, of course, uh, is the they attributed in part to social media success. But that social media sex success came because that's where the anti-war base of the Republican populist wing of the party has strong influence. They have they're able to reach a wide range of people through not only social media, but independent Internet sites. Whether it's you know your gateway pundit or a uh, uh, Western conservative review, things probably nobody's ever heard of, but that are read more than the New York Times amongst Republican conservative populace, um, and probably and once again the guy who was the predictor of all of this, the canary in the coal mine as to where the Republican populist base was going to go, was uh, a guy they don't pay much attention to, but their polling shows more conservatives trust than the New York Times, and that was Alexander Emmerich Jones out of uh, Austin, Texas. A guy that the, that the snobs love to sneer at still continues to be the best predictor of where the populist Republican base is going. And that is uh, and that is he was anti war from day one. I mean, he went on this long cussing routine about all of these people that uh, about, you know, they're just trying to get us in a nuclear war. And this is insanity. And da, da, da. the public opinion polling is Patrick Basham's for the U, for the for the Express there in the UK published. This is a guy who's. Ahead of the curve on Brexit, accurate in 2016, much more accurate in 2020 than in the states than the institutional American press. Uh, you know, just behind uh, Richard Barris, the People's Pundit, who's consistently the best pollster in the United States. And what did he find? He found that you know that you can't get more than 20 percent support for anything for any action in Ukraine in the United States that could lead to war with Russia. Uh, they're just not interested. Uh, and not only that, this was my favorite part of the poll. They asked, uh, he asked Americans, if you had a choice, uh, who do you think should step down first, Vladimir Putin from Russia or Joe Biden from the United States? A majority chose Joe Biden from the United States. A majority of Americans said Joe Biden should step down from the White House. Can you imagine if that poll was done in 1940 and they said FDR or Adolf Hitler? I mean, do you imagine if it, by double digits they would pick FDR stepping down before Hitler? And so you get, you get that dynamic is that's how embarrassing it is. The, their effort in, in the court of public opinion in the United States has failed uh, because the war is not popular. Uh, further intervention is not popular. Biden's still underwater on every meaningful measurement. On Ukraine and on foreign policy, he's just as underwater as he is on everything else. So this is not it, there's a misleading impression created by the media monopoly preaching propaganda on the war. You not only have ABC, CBS, NBC, MSNBC, and CNN all preaching the, for the war. You have most of Fox, everybody but Tucker, preaching for the war at Fox News. And the whole Murdoch machine, you know, this is an Aussie. He's not an American, but that's another story for another day. Uh, the, you know, with his New York Post, Wall Street Journal, and Fox uh, pushing a war propaganda. New York Post has put out some of the dumbest lies about the war of any newspaper in the States. It's almost to the level of British coverage. We still aren't there. British coverage is still the most insane coverage I've ever mm-hmm. read. Um, and my favorite one, latest one, was they tracked where Ukrainian refugees were going in Russia. And they told the story as if Russia's uh, kidnapping all of these Ukrainians and putting them in quasi-concentration camps throughout Ru- It's like, how do you take them helping massive refugees to the locations where they can actually absorb them and provide them housing and shelter and support and translate that into mass kidnapping into concentration camps it's like how do you get from it's like it's extraordinary uh but that you know that that that's the british press america new york post is the closest to that in the states and it's because of rupert murdoch 
That's you know his Sky News coverage is atrocious in, in Australia and and in, uh, and his other coverage as well in uh, in in the UK. It, it's not quite that bad in the states, but it's revelations. Mm. Uh, uh, but the bottom line is they don't have the support to do any more military action. And that's why I'll be curious how much uh, they still have a lot of institutional control for something like a budget, a budget vote. And again, it's saddled with pork that's going to somebody's buddy ever, mm. uh, the entire in the, in the House and the Senate. But if that number grows by more than the people who voted against the sanctions, then they're in trouble if it just grows at all, because generally there's a fear factor up on the Hill. There's a reason why there was only one senator to vote against the Patriot Act to challenge the deep state directly on a position the ordinary American doesn't have that much stake in. In other words, 40 billion, it's 40 billion. It's, it's you know, but on the U.S. budgetary side, you know, it's a couple of days. So the uh, it, it's uh, it's big for Ukraine. It's not so big for the U.S. But I, I guarantee it'll be unpopular. Foreign aid has never been popular in the United States. Doesn't matter who it's to. I mean, outside of like hurricane, hurricanes and earthquakes, those kind of things. Yeah, if you ask the American people, you for forty billion dollars going to Ukraine, you're going to get two thirds no. Um, and in particular, in the Democratic Party, who's opposed to this further intervention of the war, is is the exact voter groups they need to have turn out in the midterms: Black voters, Hispanic voters, and younger voters. But particularly African American and Latino. That's the Quinnipiac poll showed. That was the big group that was like mm -mm, not interested in any further involvement in this war, not surprisingly disproportionately represented in the armed services uh, and part of the working class community within the Democratic base. The uh, So I, it'll be interesting to see. I think the bill will still pass. I'm just curious if it gets more than 20, more than 30, more than 40. How many people oppose it? Because that will be the sign that they're just like the U.N. vote a month ago or so. They have been losing ground politically here in the United States to support further action in Ukraine, not gaining ground. Mm -hmm. They're losing ground in Europe as well, actually. I mean, I've been seeing some polling in Germany and where polling was overwhelmingly in support of intervention a few weeks ago with the change in economic conditions in Germany. Um, it's now about 50-50. So that's actually quite a big shift in opinion in Germany. Um, Robert, you sent us uh, some time ago some absolutely eye-watering polling statistics for the midterms. I mean, I'm always interested in the midterms because I sometimes think that what happens in America in the midterms is more important. Uh, it has a bigger impact in Europe than it does in America itself in the sense that I sometimes get the sense that the midterms in America, well, you know, they're just the midterms. I mean, you know, you have midterms. Congress is almost changing. But in Europe, remember, we are or, or we like to act as if we are, you know, your 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 satellites, your vassals, if you like. So we always have to see what's going on in the capital where, you know, where where the, where the king is, if you like, what, what's happening there. So people always follow the midterms in the political class, certainly in Britain follows the midterms very, very closely. And I'm going to say this, if the results are as you say, there's going to be, certainly in Britain, a big shock if um, we have the kind of shift to the Republicans that you see in the US in the midterms. Um, British, British elite opinion is going to be extremely nervous about what that means, because what has happened in Britain and I think elsewhere in Europe, is that when the administration, when Biden came in, there was this you know, surge of relief. We've got somebody we can work with again. We've, you know, we've, Trump is behind us. We don't have to worry about him anymore. This is somebody who's, you know, we know well, uh, who's really, you know, shares our views on every subject. And my God, now it's turning out that he's unpopular. And it looks as if all these people from the backwoods that in America who we don't really know much about, but who we're very nervous of that they're coming back to the foreground again. And that might have an important effect on the way policy works out in Europe too. So what is going to happen in the midterms? Is it going to be as uh, that opinion poll that you sent us suggests? Yeah, so Patrick Basham's expectations is that Republicans mm. gain 70 or more seats in the House. Mm and have one of the biggest margins they've ever had in the House of Representatives uh, since at least the 1920s. And that uh, you're going to have five or six Senate seats picked up so that Republicans will have a solid, you know, 10 seat or so margin in the U.S. Senate. 
and uh, and then similar, you know, 50, 60 massive margin in the House. It will also be the most populous in the Republican caucus in the House and the Senate since the 1920s. Um, I mean, there hasn't been, I mean, like I said, you know, the Rand Paul is the closest you get on war issues. And even he hasn't pushed back consistently on the Russia narrative. Um, whereas you're probably looking at J.D. Vance, Eric Greitens out of Missouri, Blake Masters out of Arizona, Adam Laxalt out of Nevada. All of them have made, have either refused to make any big pro go to war statements or explicit Trumpish, we shouldn't be involved statements. And that, you know, so you'll have the biggest, most populous in the Senate since the 1920s on issues of war and foreign conflict. We're still a ways away from the Senate reflecting American public opinion on it, but it would be a lot closer uh, to it. So right now it, it would be an absolute disaster. Biden is the most unpopular president polling wise for a Democratic president in the history of polling in America. Uh, he is he is trolling near the depths at which Nixon was during Watergate, at which uh, uh, at, at various points Poppy Bush was towards the very end, and George W. Bush was after the disaster of the combination of the war and, and bailouts in 20, 2008. And Biden is it's almost a very comparable to W. W. was getting us involved in dumb foreign entanglements that had turned deeply unpopular, and at the same time was having a disastrous economy that he was mishandling and mismanaging and bailing out the protected privileged classes to such a degree that Democrats had their sweep in 06 in the House and the Senate and then in the White House in 2008. Um, they just didn't offer a viable alternative because neoliberalism was no more attractive than neoconservatism to the ordinary average American worker, uh, economically or geopolitically. And so, uh, yeah, right now it's going to be a, uh, a bloodbath on, on par with uh, 1994 and probably worse. I mean, Clinton was just unpopular due to some cultural issues. He, I mean, the economy wasn't that bad in 1994. He wasn't, he wasn't entangling us in some, another dumb European war, especially. I mean, the whole America was founded on, please, no more dumb European war involvement. Um, you know, that to make it Europe, I thought Biden would get us involved in an African war, you know, Ethiopia, someplace like that, you know, justify it as, hey, we're stopping the second Rwanda and all that kind of routine. To get it, Ukraine, that's one of the dumbest places to get us involved in a war. Uh, the deep state should have thought ahead, you know, not China, not Russia. Don't make that your adversary, you know, yeah. make uh, some tiny little tin can country in Africa, your uh, yeah. army in Africa, your, your enemy. But nope, nope. We had to go big. Uh, and so you look at this aggregate uh, right now, it's a disaster. Like there's all these memes going around that, you know, how do you get to 81 million or 80, you know, 81 million votes for Biden or 81? Uh, you know, you add 33 percent job approval, 40, 40 billion to Ukraine. Uh, and the increase in the, in the inflation rate of 8%, and boom, you got 81. So, I mean, it's stuff like that. Uh, mm -hmm. So th this is this is a guy that's persona non grata, uh, but they have no alternative. Kamala mm -hmm. Harris is even more unpopular. Mm -hmm. Trump now, I mean, Trump is for the first time in his political career back to getting favorable approval ratings in some surveys, which he had never mm -hmm. had the entire time. Mm -hmm. His personal approval rating was always underwater. Uh, even when he was tied in the polls. And, and usually he was slightly, well, he was almost always way behind in the polls. The polls just exaggerated his deficit. But now some of those same polls have him ahead. And what that means is you're talking about Ronald Reagan 1980 kind of landslide is what would happen if the, if the presidential election was held today, uh, was reheld today between Trump and Biden. So you're looking at a massive de Democratic wipeout in the midterms mm -hmm. unless something radical changes. Mm -hmm. And that's probably what makes it so dangerous at the moment, yeah. because the most logical place for them to change the narrative, for them to shift the script, for them to dramatically move. Well, look at American history. When has America got involved in foreign entanglements? Uh, you know, remember the main, the hell with Spain, the sinking of the main in the, in the Havana mm. Harbor, 1898, Spanish American war. The, there were certain elements that wanted, you know, to, 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 from a dying, decaying Spanish empire, steal those territories from Puerto Rico to the Philippines, but they needed a pretext. The pretext was an attack on America. Then, uh, the sinking of the Lusitania didn't immediately result in world war one. Indeed, Woodrow Wilson said, I, he ran in 1916. I kept you out of war. That was his, that was his winning slogan. 
Well, a year later, dragged us right into it. But they used the attack on the Lusitania, which they misrepresented the facts concerning, uh, to be, hey, the Germans attacked us first. We got to go in. Then World War II, of course, the attack on Pearl Harbor was the justification for our entry, even though you can research the history of that as to how much FDR did or didn't do things to prevent that from occurring. Uh, then you have, uh, I mean, Korean War. There was an attack on South Korea where U.S. soldiers were located at the time. Vietnam War, Gulf of Tonkin. Look at these these terrible Viet Cong. They've attacked our poor little ships just like, sitting in the harbor. Of course, there were no attacks on August 4th that night. The attack happened two days before when we were up helping the South Vietnamese raid the North Vietnamese waters. And we weren't in international waters. We were in North Vietnamese waters. But, you know, that's a story that only came out long after the vote had been taken. But again, attack on America, justification for entry to war. The Afghanistan war, of course, we, we use that as 9-11 is the basis for that. We use 9-11 again because, hey, if you got one script, why not use it twice to go into Iraq the second time? Mm. And so if you look at what the, what would they need to enter the mm. NATO, I mean, uh, uh, to get in, to put troops on the ground, because I agree with what you said the other day, Alexander. They've lost the political war. They've lost the economic war. The only way NATO wins the war against uh, this proxy war against Russia and Ukraine is boots on the ground. NATO boots on the ground. They need trained soldiers, trained professionals, trained pilots to be able to equal the balance of power or they're weeks away from the Ukrainian army collapsing uh, mm -hmm. in the eastern part of Ukraine. And then nothing to stop Russia from saying, let's go ahead and add Odessa and return her to uh, to Elizabeth's homeland. I mean, I Absolutely. think he... I was no, going to say, didn't he actually even cite Elizabeth in his speech? He made some reference. In, it was forget. Maybe it was a second speech that he made. But the that dynamic, that's the risk. And I think the only way that happens, though, it, it would help the uh, the in Democrats' mind. They're in a no lose situation right now. They're going to get crushed anyway. What could possibly reserve, uh, reverse the script? Uh, a, a global war, a global mm -hmm. war that reportrays Biden as the adult in the room. Turns out he's the adult with a diaper, uh, but you know that's that's what it is. The uh, but you know put that back into the public narrative, shift the story framework. It helped W. W was sinking in two thousand and one before nine eleven in Iraq. That led him to resurge and do well in two thousand and two and win in two hold power two thousand and four. 